Welcome and good morning, everyone. It is September 17th, 2021, and we're all here to discuss uniting to dismantle racism and militarism in US foreign policy. This panel is co-sponsored by the Friends Committee on National Legislation and the Center for International Policy. I'm your moderator, Diana Olbaum, and I serve as Senior Strategist and Legislative Director for Foreign Policy at FCNO. So please go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat. You can put your names and organizations and where you're physically located today. You should also check your Zoom names to make sure they're correct and add your pronouns. And again, we would really appreciate it if you could keep your camera on, but your sound muted. So we, um, I will also note that uh, closed captioning is available from the bottom of your screen if you click on the CC and the speakers will be recorded on this session. So we are delighted to bring you this discussion today, which emerges from a working group that was held over six months between November 2020 and April 2021. In those meetings, we reflected on why our country is so stuck in a way of relating to the world that is so harmful to so many people at home and abroad, what a better alternative would be, what stands in the way of getting there, and what steps we need to take to overcome those obstacles. We could only manage to have a small group for those discussions, but we think it's incredibly important to engage with a much wider variety of individuals and organizations. And that's why we're so excited to have you here today. We're gonna to be posting links to three documents in the chat. The first is a long paper that my co-host Sally Booker and I wrote based on the ideas and input we received from the working group. Although the uh, words in the report and the, and the thoughts in there are uh, just uh, our own. Um, Hopefully Wesley can put that in the chat. Um, the second is an executive summary that gives the main highlights of that long paper, which uh, Wesley will also put in the chat. And the third is our agenda for today, which also contains the photos and bios of our speakers. Uh, so hopefully you will see that as well. And uh, Wesley may need to repost those in a, a few minutes when we get more folks here, because um, we are expecting a very large group today. So to summarize the agenda briefly, we're going to start with short presentations from four speakers. Then we'll move to uh, Q&A from the audience. You can go ahead and post your questions in the chat box as you think of them, and I will try to keep track and go back to them later. And finally, we'll break down into small group discussions and come back together to share what we discussed. Before I introduce the speakers though, I'd like to do a quick poll. It'll just take a couple of minutes and will help us get a sense of where we are at the start. Can we bring up the poll? So um, it looks like the vast majority of people see racism and militarism as a huge obstacle to their work. They mention it not as often as big a problem as it is, although um, I'm glad to see that it is that racism is named um, often by at least 44% of you. And um, interestingly, although maybe not surprisingly, we um, find it a little easier to mention militarism as a specific problem. So I'm gonna stop sharing that. Thank you all for participating. Um, I'm gonna just do some brief introductions of our speakers and then you have the link to the full bios. Um, maybe Wesley can um, post it again for those who missed it. So Sally Booker is president and CEO of the Center for International Policy, which works to make a peaceful, just and sustainable world the central pursuit of US foreign policy. He has decades of experience in the foundation world, in UN agencies, at the US Institute of Peace and in the US Congress. And he has traveled and worked all over the world. And he is of course the co-host of this event 
and co-chaired with me the Working Group on Dismantling Racism and Militarism in U.S. Foreign Policy. Shali Gupta Barnes directs policy for the Cairo Center and the Poor People's Campaign, which brings people together to confront the interlocking evils of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and the war economy, and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. She has a background in law, economics, and human rights, and has spent more than 17 years working with and for poor and dispossessed communities. Nana Jamfi is the Executive Director of Black Alliance for Just Immigration. She is a human rights and criminal defense attorney with over three decades of service to the movement for Black liberation and over 20 years experience directing Black social justice organizations and networks. She serves as a professor in the Pan-African Studies Department at the California State University, Los Angeles, president of the National Conference of Black Lawyers, and host of two popular radio shows in, in Los Angeles. And Toby Chow is the founding director of Justice is Global, a special project of people's action to build a just and sustainable global economy and defeat right-wing nationalism. He is a strategist, organizer, political educator, and writer. He is particularly known for his critical work regarding the US-China relationship and the rise of Sinophobia in the US. Um, so let me start with you, Sally. What was the motivation behind organizing this working group on dismantling racism and militarism? Why are CIP and FCNO engaged in this effort together to bring people together around racism and militarism in US foreign policy? And why now? Thank you, Diana. <laughs> um, well, a major motivation for this project, aside from the obvious desperate need to change US foreign policy, was more specifically that last year, the ongoing killings of black and brown people by police in this country, along with the COVID-19 pandemic and its devastating and disproportionate impact on communities of color, laid bare the deadly consequences of structural racism and militarism in this country, and it provoked the largest mass movement in American history. The nation found itself in a unique moment when systemic white supremacy and the state's use of violence against people of color was for once at the forefront of the national debate. But why then was there not more attention to the role of racism and militarism in the formulation and execution of U.S. national security and foreign policy. The massive death toll and destruction of America's endless wars of the past two decades in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, the emergence of vaccine apartheid in the face of the global coronavirus pandemic, the continued exorbitant financing of the military industrial carceral complex at the expense of human needs at home, the xenophobia determining immigration policies, and the increasing warmongering aimed at China, among other concerns, are all driven by these same forces and ideas. So we did not see this question of foreign policy as a separate matter, but rather a rather suppressed and deeply important subject that had to be addressed as an equal part of what many were prematurely referring to as a national reckoning on race. We rejected this false dichotomy of domestic versus international interests and policies. We felt the need for an equally urgent interrogation of the roots of this country's foreign policies and of America's very conceptualization of national security. But our aim in bringing people together around this problem was not to convene a conventional study group to make policy recommendations. Rather, it was to convene leaders from the major social movements and progressive communities already engaged in the work domestically and internationally. We brought together people who wouldn't necessarily have an opportunity to work together, though all of their work intersects at multiple levels and is essential 
to changing U.S. foreign policy. We asked them to help us articulate a common understanding of this problem of the force of racism and militarism in shaping U.S. national security doctrine and policies. Collectively, we worked on an alternative vision for the U.S. role in the world based on justice and security for all. And together, we identified the most important structural and systemic obstacles to change and began to explore how we might overcome them. Ultimately, and with today's discussion, we want to continue to figure out how progressive movements in the United States can achieve a meaningful shift away from racism and militarism as principal determinants of U.S. national security and foreign policy and the related distribution of national resources. We believe there is a unique, perhaps once in a generation opportunity to change the overall framing of U.S. foreign policy and gain traction for a fundamental redirection of policy and a thorough reconceptualization of national security, one that may suddenly seem reasonable and necessary to a majority of Americans. But our sense of urgency is not only because of the opportunity, but because of the necessity. Time is literally running out. If we cannot figure out how to achieve successful international cooperation to solve the COVID-19 pandemic, then how can we possibly stop catastrophic climate change? And if we continue to pour trillions of dollars into the Pentagon and endless wars and the insane growth of nuclear arsenals, how will we ever be able to contribute to a sustainable global peace and economic development freed from the imperatives of the arms and fossil fuel industries. U.S. national security policies have not kept Americans safe. Instead, they've destabilized large parts of the world, fueled the wasteful proliferation of arms, distracted from urgent global challenges, and drained national and international resources that could more productively be invested in human security at home and around the world. It's long past time that we acknowledge and address this failure. Time is indeed running out, and I see that my time has run out. Thank you so much, Sally. Really appreciate those uh, important words and, uh, that, and that overview. Um, Shally, I'd like to ask you, what are some lessons we can take from other social movements over the past 50 years that can be applied to building a groundswell for peace and justice today. Thank you, Diana. Um, obviously, you know, the from the Poor People's Campaign, we've we've looked very closely at the historic 1968 Poor People's Campaign, which uh, which came at the tail end of the Civil Rights Movement, and you know had been through those years of the Civil Rights Movement developing a real infrastructure. Uh, connecting churches, youth, community organizations, new organizations, whose responsibility was really to build up the, the, abil the, the capacity to bring these different sectors together. And um, after winning the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, after seeing the war on poverty started and then being neglected because of the Vietnam War, uh, Reverend Dr. King and others began to make deeper connections between militarism, racism, and economic exploitation. Um, not just in words, not just theoretically, but actually trying to build new organizational forms that could bring together the, uh, the infrastructure of the civil rights movement with the, the protests and activity of the anti, you know, the, the, the movement against Vietnam, the Vietnam War, that could bring together the community-based organizations and protests that were happening in cities in the North um, with, you know, farm worker organizing, welfare rights organizing, all with the intention of bringing people together beyond their specific fronts of struggle, recognizing that nothing they could do on their own would be powerful enough to confront the systems and structures that were at the roots of the injustices they were organizing against. And this, this really did take new forms of organization, um, which wasn't easy. Each one of these different sectors had their own agendas that they were invested in. But unless they, under, they identified that common ground from which they could move forward together, um, they would never be powerful enough to change fundamentally the systems, um, the power system, the power structures they were facing. And, you know, the lesson that we take from that is really being rooted and connected and committed 
to these local struggles, whatever they may be, uh, housing, mass incarceration, water, uh, uh, low wage work, and, but also building um, a broader infrastructure and organizational form that connects those communities, not just in words again, but with the actions that, that can be taken together. Um, this is about more, um, as, as Sally said, than enacting the correct policy or, or legislation. It's about building power to affect change and power comes from organization. Over the past 50 years, the regressive forces that we're up against have become stronger and more organized. Trillions and trillions of dollars have been moved in their direction to militarize our society. Um, and and you know, all of these actions, they disproportionately affect the poor uh, and poor color, poor communities of color at home and around the world. As, as Reverend Dr. William Barber, the co-chair of the National Poor People's Campaign often says, if those forces which have their own interests will come together around voter suppression against immigrant rights to deny health care, to deny living wages, to fund war and to cut taxes, if they are cynical enough to join forces in their interests, then we who are confronting the injustices that they're able to perpetuate through their unity, we have to be smart enough to do the same. Again, not just in word, but in deed. Um, and you know, I, I think often about the people who make up uh, the Poor People's Campaign. Um, and this morning I was thinking about Justin Pearson, a young, uh, young man from Tennessee, from Memphis, who started this organization called Memphis Community Against, uh, Against the Pipeline, Against the Bahalia Pipeline. He's deeply connected with Memphis community members um, around this pipeline, which is endangering their lives. He's also a leader in the Tennessee campaign, Tennessee Poor People's Campaign, which makes him a leader in this national Poor People's Campaign and connects not only the MCAP struggle, but uh, to you know, other pipeline struggles like Line 3 or to Cancer Alley in Louisiana. But he's also connected to struggles around healthcare, around housing, around voter suppression. So if we can actually build that infrastructure that identifies and connects the Justins and the Justines and the so many more you know, individuals who are raising the alarm in communities across the country that are most impacted by the, by the uh, racist militarist paradigm and connect these communities to this broader movement infrastructure to take action together, um, we'll not only be able to you know, nurture, develop, and unleash a power that can confront and dismantle this paradigm, but establish, we can actually establish a new basis to form this more equitable, just, and peaceful society we all know is possible, we all know we need. And so uh, that is, I think, the foremost lesson that, um, that we draw from in the Poor People's Campaign from, from at least the, the 1968 campaign. And this is the lesson we have to um, learn and apply uh, for, for our task at hand today. Thank you so much, Shelly. That was an incredible uh, reminder of the lessons that have been learned. Um, and as, uh, as the group can see, we are all working very hard to keep to our five minutes, and I really appreciate that. So um, next, uh, we will hear from Nana. Um, Nana, you know, the problems that migrants face are right at the intersection of racism and militarism, both at home and abroad. Could you talk about the ways that these systems of oppression impact your work? Absolutely, and I'll also attempt to do that in my five minutes. Thank you so much for the question because the question actually involves so many different ways, right, that this impacts our work. So the Black Alliance for Just Immigration is the largest Black-led immigrant rights organization in the country. We educate, we advocate, we organize on behalf of the roughly 10 million Black migrants and our families here in the United States, but we also work alongside multi-generational African Americans for racial, social, and economic justice, particularly for that reason, because as Black migrants, we feel that intersection of migrant rights and racism, particularly anti-Black racism, that militarism adds to um, in terms of how we are dealt with and, and addressed, allowed in or not allowed in as Black migrants. We only need to look at the story that broke late yesterday about thousands of Haitians. The estimation is between eight to 10,000 um, Haitian asylum seekers. And we know that there's gonna be other Black uh, migrants from other places that are also included in that number who are being cramped under a bridge in Texas 
living in deplorable conditions. And I hope that for those of you that haven't checked out that story, really check that story out. How does this happen? Well, it is that combination of militarism and racism, particularly anti-Black racism that results in this. It's you know what defines the root causes of barriers to migration for Black migrants and other migrants of color, particularly Black migrants in the United States, in Europe, and in the West, which includes Australia, for example, which isn't quite connected to Europe, but becomes the West in the global South. Borders not only define the contours of a country's geography, but it also defines their politics and the ways in which those politics and economics define that country. Borders are about who does belong and who does not belong, as much as they are about who is human and who is not human. Who is deemed to be human, right? Who is worthy of migration has been racialized, both in this country, in Europe, and in the West, in ways that you don't, and, and in, you know, across the globe, in ways that don't have to exist. It doesn't have to be that because people are black, because people are brown, that they are, because people are Asian, that they are not allowed to come into the countries. And so when we hear President Biden, when we hear Vice President Harris, when we hear Secretary Mayorkas telling Haitians, telling Central Americans and other migrants of color, don't come, right? They're saying that the administration does not consider those people, those folks who are trying to come to be human beings. To migrate is to be human. To restrict migration is to limit and restrict the expression of humanity. And so we're not surprised that the United States has decided that its immigration policy is going to be rooted in militarism and that black migrants and other migrants of color are gonna be the ones that bear the greatest burden. And so when we think of those Haitians that are under the bridge, they're not under the bridge because they want to be under the bridge. They're not under the bridge because they don't have a right to come into this country. It is because the militarism, ICE, Custom and Border Patrol, and in the case of Texas, because of Texas Governor Abbott, Texas National Guard are also a part of preventing those asylum seekers from coming into the country. Now, Baji, we often talk about the fact that white Europeans and USCNs can go to majority black countries almost anywhere in the world and live there with little restrictions, little requirements. They're not huddling under bridges. They're not you know, trying to cross rivers. They're coming in easily and freely. And we should not and cannot talk about the horrors endured by black migrants enslaved, tortured, murdered, drowned, as they attempt to flee Western military caused fires at home for the frying pans in Europe. We understand that when we're looking at the ways in which the United States has stretched its border Southern, its Southern border beyond where it's supposed to be all the way into Colombia for the specific purposes, right? Working with the militaries, the national guard, the military structures of these countries with the specific purpose of keeping black asylum seekers and indigenous asylum seekers from coming into the country. We understand that connection between racism and militarism and borders. And on this citizenship day in the United States, I think it's really apropos that we're having this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nana. That was incredibly powerful. I uh, really, really appreciate that. Um, and finally, we will hear from Toby. Um, Toby, one of the things we all saw from our discussions um, in, in the working group was that racism both shapes US foreign policy and is also exacerbated by it. So could you talk about how the anti-China narrative is grounded in racism, the impact that it's having, and how young people around the country are mobilizing against this narrative? Yeah, so um, the I'll start by talking about the connection between um, anti-Asian racism and specifically uh, Sinophobia um, and the growing US-China conflict. Um, and uh, we see the, the tie between these two things in um, 
a set of narratives about the threat that China supposedly poses uh, to people here in the United States. Um, we have seen uh, a pattern now of narratives about China that greatly exaggerate um, this threat. Uh, one example of this is um, uh, uh, can be found in uh, this landmark speech about the US-China relationship delivered last year by Trump's Secretary of State Mike Pompeo at the Richard Nixon Library, um, where he said, among other things, quote, uh, if we bend the knee now, our children's children may be at the mercy of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and he claimed that, uh, quote, securing our freedoms from the Chinese Communist Party is the mission of our time. Uh, so this portrays China as an existential threat to the United States, the American way of life, uh, portrays uh, the Chinese state as um, seeking to come to dominate people in the United States, you know, they're coming for our children. Um, and uh, this greatly, greatly exaggerates um, the, like any aspirations that the, the Chinese leadership might have, it greatly exaggerates the threats that China actually poses to anyone in the United States. Um, we also see a pattern of turning China into a scapegoat uh, for problems in US society uh, for uh, uh, China gets turned into a scapegoat um, for uh, tensions around racial injustice, a scapegoat for economic problems, political problems, um, and so on. And all of these uh, China threat narratives um, uh, do a couple of things. Uh, first, they, um, uh, they make the case uh, and try to build popular support um, for the idea that conflict between the US and China is inevitable. Um, and they attempt to uh, legitimate, legitimate um, uh, uh, escalation against China within US foreign policy. Um, the other impact that they have is to feed racism. Um, there is a quote uh, that really encapsulates this by uh, Professor Russell Jung, uh, who co-founded the Stop API Hate project. Uh, now that's a project that since last year has been tracking uh, incidents of anti-Asian racism. Um, and you put it this way, uh, when America China bashes, then Chinese people get bashed. And so do those who look Chinese. American foreign policy in Asia is American domestic policy for Asians. Um, and we can uh, see this manifesting uh, repeatedly in the incidents of uh, anti-Asian hate uh, that uh, Stop API Hate has tracked. Um, uh, one of the forms of rhetoric that are most frequently uh, expressed by assailants uh, who, who are engaged in these anti-Asian hate incidents uh, is rhetoric uh, blaming uh, these uh, people of Asian descent uh, for the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and this goes back to uh, this, the moment in March of last year when Trump began to use the racialized term uh, Chinese virus to describe the novel coronavirus. Uh, that's a racialized term, but it's also important to note that um, that was part of an effort by Trump to scapegoat China for his own catastrophic mismanagement of the pandemic. That was part of his effort to uh, divest himself of blame by putting all blame uh, on China for everything that's happening in the United States under his watch. Uh, and that has been taken up um, uh, by many of his followers, uh, by street level uh, racism, uh, and applied to people of Chinese descent or anyone who looks Chinese, scapegoating people who look like me for the pandemic. Um, that's just one example of where we see these uh, narratives about uh, China threat and these efforts to scapegoat China for problems in the United States translating into anti-Asian racism. Um, the flip side of this is that we also see racism feeding uh, anti-China politics in the United States. There are long-standing narratives, racist narratives about Chinese people that uh, predate uh, the current conflict and enable the escalation um, of this conflict. And many of these racist narratives, they go back to the 19th century uh, in the United States and the arrival of uh, immigrants from China and other Asian countries for the first time in the US. And then the reaction to that, uh, this movement um, uh, for 
Chinese exclusion to expel Chinese immigrants uh, from the West Coast and ethnically cleanse the West, the West Coast um, that took shape in the late 19th century. Um, some of these uh, racist narratives include the claim that uh, Chinese people form a homogenous collective, um, that we're, we're all alike, we're sort of like a single hive mind. Um, this, in, this enables the racist narrative that uh, all Chinese people are potential agents of the Chinese government and allows anti-China hawks to greatly exaggerate the threat that China poses to the US. Um, we also see narratives that uh, Chinese people are robotic, hyper-efficient workers, uh, that Chinese culture is radically foreign to white Western US culture and is somehow inscrutable. Um, these are long-standing narratives. Uh, they apply uh, to Asian countries beyond China. Um, and we see them enabling a lot of the, the the narratives that portray China as this exaggerated existential threat uh, to the US and, and to uh, the American people. Thank you so much, Toby. Really incredibly helpful um, and really four amazing presentations. So I would um, welcome questions. Um, if you post them in the chat, uh, I will start um, posing them to our panel. So please, um, Please put any questions that you have right in the chat. And while we wait for questions to come up, um, let me ask whether any of our panelists have anything that they wanted to comment on in, um, in each other's statements. Just briefly, um, thank you so much to all the other folks that have panelized um, this morning, um, at least morning uh, LA time, Toby really struck um, by some of what you're saying, particularly as it pertains to black countries. I don't know if you were able to see the interview that was done with uh, Prime Minister Manley out of, I believe it's Barbados, who was, you know, they, they were trying to harass her a little bit about and to be worried about the Chinese in Barbados. And she was like, yeah, well, the Chinese are everywhere and it's okay. We don't have a problem. Why do you? And, you know, can you talk a little bit about that aspect? Because it's not just looking at the Chinese in the United States, but part of this discussion is that the Borg, quote unquote, right, are taking over the whole planet and that trying to get everybody caught up and um, into anti-Asian sentiment. Yeah, and I think um, uh, what we see at work in, and uh, I, I did see that interview uh, and, and what that leader was uh, uh, reacting to was, um, you know, there's a set of racist dehumanizing narratives about China and Chinese people. Um, and uh, there are also these narratives about um, other countries in the global South. And we're in a dynamic where um, uh, many countries across the global South are getting caught in the middle of the US-China conflict and, uh, uh, there is an attempt to turn them by one side or the other into pawns in this great power struggle, um, which is, uh, I think, one of the uh, enormous threats of this U.S.-China conflict, the way that it's sucking more and more countries into it. And one of the racist narratives that we see at work is um, uh, this sort of like um, almost like infantilizing narrative applied to many of these countries, so in the Caribbean, in Africa, and in other parts of the global south, um, that portray them as sort of um, helpless and incapable of, of uh, attending to their own affairs, um, which then gets applied within the context of the US-China conflict uh, to portray them as like these helpless pawns at the mercy of, of, of uh, the Chinese government. Um, and what gets missed is um, that in many cases, the, the leaders in these countries, um, they have their own sense of priorities, their own sense of the, the needs of their countries. And they look at what's on offer from, in terms of help from China, and they look at what's on offer in terms of help from the United States and US allies. And they see that they're going to get things from China that they're not gonna get from the United States. Um, and you know, there's some things to critique in, in the way that uh, the relationship that they, that, that China, the way that China then comes into these countries but there's a reality there about like real interests um, that I think a lot of US critics of these relationships um, um, just have a lot of trouble um, facing up. And I see a question in the, uh, I'm sorry, Nana, did you wanna add something to that? 
No, I was just thanking him for that because I think that's a, a major issue that doesn't get talked about enough. I think it's a touchy issue, but it's one that's important to speak on. So I appreciate it. Thank you. And I see a question in the chat from Earl Arnold for Toby asking, um, would you comment on the racist dimensions of the US unwillingness to end the Korean War, not even with an official de declaration that we are no longer at war? Oh man, um, so this is not uh, this is not by any means an area of expertise, but absolutely uh, the 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 narratives about Korea in U.S. foreign policy are just rife with racism. Um, uh, there are just just in the same way that there are racist narratives exaggerating the China threat, there are also racist narratives exaggerating the North Korean threat. Um, uh, these claims about just the, the these ideas that the North Koreans are somehow essentially irrational um, or suicidal um, efforts to scapegoat the North Korean leaders for all failures in every peace process, when in reality, very often, mo more often, we see that the United States government is responsible for failures in negotiations. Uh, also, there is a series of racist narratives that get applied to South Korean leadership and the people of South Korea, um, just the desires and hopes and aspirations of people in South Korea, uh, and this is supposedly our ally, <laughs> get just systematically erased um, uh, uh, in, in, in order to sort of assert these hawkish foreign policies um, and sort of impose it on the region. So um, yeah, uh, I, I think that's all over the place uh, in, in that aspect of US foreign policy. Thanks, Toby. We have a question from Isaac uh, Evans France that is for the whole panel. Um, thank you for pointing out how racism plays out in US foreign policy. How do you see racism playing out in liberal progressive foreign policy advocacy? What do you never want to hear again? And what would you like to hear more of? And are there like the people on this? Sally, Nana, Sally? Well, I'll, Sally, go ahead. I'll offer a comment. I mean, one, I think it's important at this particular, we make sure we're able to distinguish between these new diversity and inclusion efforts, i.e. increasing representation or sometimes tokenism in the U.S. security and foreign policy establishment, kind of systemic and structural change that we're looking for. So for example, uh, when the Biden administration was considering who to name as the next Secretary of Defense, the big debate, even among progressive circles, was, you know, should it be the first woman? Or should it be the first African American, as opposed to looking at the substance of what fundamentally needs to change at the Pentagon in terms of its share, enormous share of the U.S. budget? Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's unacceptable that the discussion and the debate wasn't on how do we end this military industrial carceral complex that is draining us of the resources that we need to address not only the challenges at home, but the common challenges that we need to engage the world in in addressing. So that that would be one thing I'm particularly concerned about, because, you know, this working group worked in the transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. And while we felt some relief with the end of the Trump administration, we could already see the signs of continuity in the Biden administration of this fundamental paradigm that drives U.S. foreign policy. And I might, yeah, I might add, I mean, I see this comment also in the chat that this idea that, uh, I mean, I think we should never um, hear again that wars make us safer, but, but going beyond that, that militarism uh, makes us any safer and understanding the full extent of that. Um, the National Priorities Project uh, put out recently a report showing that $21 trillion has gone to militarizing our society over the past two decades. That's not only war, that's prisons, that's incarceration, that's policing, that's surveillance, it's our um, immigration system, it's across the board. And, um, you know, it, it's, it, the argument cannot be made that any of that has made us any safer. 
And so really being able to target that, that narrative um, and to just, you know, break, th break, break through its underlying assumptions that there's, you know, some, some of, you know, some people here have to be connected, you know, protected from whatever is outside these borders and, you know, violence and militarism are the way to do that. Uh, just I, I, if we never hear that again, then we will be better off. Thanks. So I, Nana? Sorry to interrupt. So I would add, I have a hashtag that I use every once in a while. Hashtag, I know what you said last summer, because people have forgotten what they said last summer. <laughs> but I remember. It's like, I know, I remember what you said last summer. And last summer, people talked about racial justice, and they talked about centering, if not abolition, and which would include the end to militarization, but centering at least the defunding, the decrease, the diminution um, of those things. And yet, what we see people talking about is increasing the number of uh, uh, border patrol, increasing the influence and impact of ICE, increasing surveillance, increasing um, all these policies that target um, Black migrants and other migrants of, of color. You know, we're continuing with Title 42. Like everything that people said they weren't going to do anymore is exactly what people are doing right now. We're particularly looking at the United States, but beyond um, the U.S. as well. What I don't want to hear anymore would be this um, repeated issue of needing to have military at the border, that these borders need to be these military, you know, militarized zones. And we know that if you want to go to Mexico and party and come back, you're okay. You're not, you know, they, there used to be a time when there was no militarization there whatsoever. That militarization happened to keep out Black and other um, asylum seekers of color. And so we know that militarization at the border is not necessary. Thanks, Nana. And I think Toby wanted to say something on this as well. Yeah, um, I have a long list of grievances against uh, the, the liberal segment of the foreign policy establishment. Um, I will pick on one again, and again, this is relevant to the specific to the US-China relationship. Um, there's this rhetoric uh, that portrays the conflict between the US-China is, is this almost cosmic struggle between democracy and authoritarianism, um, where the United States is identified essentially with democracy, while China is identified with, with authoritarianism. Um, and this is troubling for a lot of reasons. One thing that this does is it, uh, like, obfuscates the fact that the threat of authoritarianism to the United States is coming from within the United States. Uh, my understanding is there's a racist authoritarian um, uh, protest in DC that's scheduled for today or something like that, right? And, uh, and this is a follow-up to January 6th. Um, uh, uh, so this is part of how uh, anti-China hawkish foreign policy gets legitimized. Um, but it ends up obscuring the real threat to authoritarianism. And uh, this is something that we hear from members of the Biden administration, from um, uh, uh, liberal figures within the foreign policy establishment. One really toxic impact this has within US politics is it ends up um, sort of throwing up cover for the right-wing authoritarian movement within the United States. The people leading this movement love it when people identify authoritarianism as this foreign thing, because then that allows them to sort of um, uh, paint themselves as, as the Democrats and, and obscure their own authoritarianism. So this is very dangerous stuff and, and it needs to stop. Thanks, Toby. I see a question um, from Susan Navi in the chat, which points to an issue that um, you know, we dealt with in, in, in our working group, which is that you know, we, we all have specific issues that we work on and they're all very different and it's very easy to get stovepiped. So um, what are some steps that groups on this webinar can take to help make these connections uh, that all the speakers have talked about while still focusing on our individual missions? Shelley, do you want to take that? I can at least offer, you know, from the Poor People's Campaign. So we are a national campaign and we're organized in over 40 states in the country. So each state has a coordinating committee uh, you know, that, that you can find on our website, poorpeoplescampaign.org. And through that infrastructure, if you connect up with the committee, the committee itself is then you know, connected to our national infrastructure. And we encourage each of our state committees to work with local struggles, local communities, 
um, even when national organizations approach us, we always turn them towards, you know, where are your members? Where are your chapters? Connect with our states on the ground. Because, at, you know, fundamentally, we're a national movement that's rooted in these local struggles, because um, that's the only way we're going to build up the kind of uh, uh, interlocked, networked national movement that we need. And so, you know, we would welcome anybody on this call to reach out to uh, your your uh, your local uh, Poor People's Campaign Coordinating Committee, uh, state chapter, um, reach out to the national campaign. If you're an organization, we'll connect you with, uh, you know, we'll connect up with our national partners or faith partners. Um, and and in fact, we are we are headed towards a season of activity that will lead up to June 2022. Um, and you know, we'll be engaging in a series of. Um, you know, regional actions and activities across these states uh, that'll build up to June. And so there are a lot of different ways that, that we would really welcome everybody on this call to connect up with us, to bring your relationships, bring your network so we can, so we can, um, so we can really confront the, the forces that we're up against and, and make, some, make some real changes. Thanks, Shelly. I think we have time for one more before we go to the next segment. Uh, Sally, did you want to address that? Uh, I just wanted to make a comment and more explicitly say, please support the Poor People's Campaign. Um, it is a way of integrating all the work and issues that we're talking about, but also please support all of the organizations that uh, representatives came together and were part of this uh, working group uh, that we put together, whether it's 350.org or Common Defense or Baji uh, or Global Justice or Madre. I mean, look at the list, read the report. There are not enough resources and not enough opportunities for us all to work together, right? And, you know, as we keep trying to point out, it's not specific individual policies that we need to address. It is, I mean, obviously we need to address them, but it is the deeper fundamental change that we have to achieve if we're gonna be successful in dismantling racism and militarism in US foreign policy. 